Just to introduce myself, I'm Yvette Lagantry. I am a member of the Board of Advisors of Mir Alliance, so that's Migrant, Immigrant, and Refugee Rights Alliance. And for my own background in immigration, I am retired from a long career with the federal government, working with the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security in immigration programs, managing immigration programs, and uh, in, in international affairs related to immigration. I served as the um, regional attache for immigration working out of the American Embassy in Mexico City, uh, where I had responsibility for immigration matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. I also served as the first director of international operations for the Department of Homeland Security, among other related positions. We're going to get started by introducing some of our panelists, like a short introduction before we invite each one to speak, just for your knowledge. We have a, a poet with us with, to add a little artistic touch to our conversation, and that's Indran Amir Fanayagam, I, which I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yes, yes it did. Thank you. <laughs> and he will uh, shortly be reading a poem to us to, intro to introduce our, our conversation. We also have with us Brian Concanon, who's the executive director of Project Blueprint, and we'll hear more about that shortly. And we have Guadalupe Correa Cabrera, who is an associate professor at, at George Mason University, and we'll learn more about her shortly. But to get started, I'd like to invite Indran to read a poem from his book, The Migrant States, and he will, just, he will read to us the migrants reply. Thank you very much. Honored to be part of this conversation. I'm reading the migrants reply from a, a book called The Migrant States it just came out this year. The migrants reply. We have been running for so long. We are tired. We want to rest. We don't want to wake up tomorrow and pack our bags. We have gone 10,000 miles. We have loaded boarded a rowboat, tugboat, bus, freight train. We have a cell phone and some bread. Our eyes are dry. Our breath needs washing. What next? You are putting up a wall on your southern flank. What an irony. The country that accepts refugees does not want us. We qualify. We have scars and our host governments hunted at least some of us. The rest fled in fear. Gangs do not spare even the children. White vans took away our uncles, our cousins. Do you think they've been made into plowshares? Aye, what are you saying? Too easy, too easy to wear our hearts in these words, in slings, on our faces, furrowed, perplexed. What happened to kindness to strangers? Why do we have to be herded like prisoners held in a holding camp? We are human beings, and like you, in safer countries, we have the same obligation to save ourselves and our children. Oh, the children, look at them. Give them food and school and a new set of clothes. Give them a chance. Whether you are red or blue, the eye of the hurricane does not discriminate. We are your tumbling weeds, hurling cars, flooding banks, and we are diggers of the dikes. We can teach you so many languages and visions. You would learn so much. You would never, ever say, lock us up. Thank you, Indran. And I think that it's important for us to hear that the migrants reply from the voice of the migrant, the idea that we are hearing from the voice of the migrant, because often in these discussions, we're speaking of these issues from the 10,000 foot level, looking at it, but here, this is an opportunity, Indra, thank you from that perspective from the Migrants Reply. And I know that you've had the migrant experience yourself, having been born in, in Sri Lanka, and you've lived in many countries. Uh, for those of you who are new to Mir Alliance, I thought I should give you a little background about, our, about us. Um, it's a nonprofit global coalition of individuals and activists and organizations working to protect and advance the rights and dignity of migrants, immigrants, and refugees. So please visit our website, miralliance.org, to learn more and follow our blog, which is published on Medium, and follow Mir's pages on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to keep abreast of our activities. 
So now today's discussion on the topic of migration and foreign affairs is offered in partnership with Project Blue Point, represented here by its executive director, Brian Clincannon. And we're going to address how foreign policy decisions result in conditions that spur irregular migration. Please, as we continue the, with the discussion, enter your comments and questions in the chat box. And about midway, we will start to, we will start to listen to those questions. So again, we're going to start with our first speaker uh, following our poem. And that's Brian Concannon, who is a human rights lawyer and an activist, again, the executive director of Project Blueprint. Blueprint, which promotes a progressive human rights-based United States foreign policy by including the perspectives of those impacted by U.S. actions abroad into policy discussion. Brian directed the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti from 2004 to 2019. The Institute for Justice and Democracy relays the Haitians' fights for justice to countries abroad where decisions about Haitian rights are made and helps Haitians uphold the human rights they need in force to escape poverty and vulnerability. Mr. Kokanen lived and worked in Haiti for nine years, from 1995 to 2004, first working with the United Nations, and then after 1996 with the Bureau des Avocats Internationales. Mr. Kokanen is a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and Middlebury College. So, Brian, would you please open with your remarks. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you and Mir Alliance for inviting all of us and for organizing this discussion. Um, I, I, I think Indran's poem is a hard act to follow. I'm afraid that much of what I'm going to say is, is kind of what he said, except longer and in less poetic language. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll do my best. Uh, and, and I really do look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Cabrera's uh, um, intervention, which I think is going to be very complimentary, and I look forward to talking about how all the different perspectives that we're bringing here today fit together, along with what the issues that that uh, people in the audience want to raise. Uh, I think that now is a particularly important time to be having this discussion. Certainly, we have um, we have a constellation, or perhaps a universe of crises. Uh, but I also think that we have um, a we have several historic opportunities to to both correct and resolve some of the current crises, but also to make long term changes um, that I guess to use Indran's words that have so people don't can can people who don't want to pack up their bags tomorrow won't have to. So people living abroad can be supported living in their homes and not driven to uh, away from their homes and in some cases to the United States. I'd, I'd like to start with uh, talking about my own trajectory, what brought me to, to this conversation. Um, as Yvette mentioned, I, I lived for nine years in Haiti and what we were trying to do then was to make the justice system work for the majority of Haitians who are poor. Uh, and this was right after a dictatorship which had generated you know, lots of, of um, migration. And in fact, it was, the, it was the, the prospect of more and more Haitians coming on boats into Miami that eventually pushed the United States to try to end the, uh, the dictatorship. And we were trying to build the, the country in a way, the justice system in a way to be responsive to the majority. And that was part of a broader project of building the country so that Haitians could stay there, Haitians could live prosperous, stable lives. Uh, and there was a lot in that nine years that succeeded by almost every measure, education, healthcare, governance, uh, human rights, the justice system. Haiti made uh, significant progress. Certainly there's a lot of work that was undone, but it was undeniable and significant progress. Um, but the United States government didn't like the economic policies that Haiti's government was, was um, trying to apply. So we imposed a development assistance on the government, which of course made it hard for the government to deliver basic services and, and actually started driving migration again. 
And then the U.S. actually kidnapped Haiti's president, and which was the culmination of a coup d'etat in 2004. And when that happened, all the progress of those nine years was, was erased almost overnight. And again, you had Haitians desperately climbing onto boats and doing whatever they could to come to the United States. Because again, you know, again, as Indran said, white vans were coming for their uncles and their cousins, and you had you know, massive repression, massive uh, economic dislocation, hunger, uh, unemployment, lack of health care, uh, the same factors that, that drive people. When, when that happened, I realized that my place was no longer in Haiti. I, mean, I love living in Haiti. I love working with, with, with my Haitian collaborators. But it became clear that as an American, my place was to bring what I had learned from my Haitian collaborators back to the United States, to really bring their fight back to the U.S. because that's where a lot of decisions about their rights were being made. And uh, we, we knew that as long as the U.S. president could overthrow Haiti's president because he disliked the economic policy, nothing we did in Haiti was sustainable. And, and so that we really needed to make the United States safe for democracy in Haiti by creating uh, a, a, an organization in the United States that was a applying pressure on U.S. policy to make it more fair and, and responsive to our, our human rights obligations. Um, so we started IJDH and uh, we worked, we, we supported our colleagues back in Haiti, but we also worked on trade policies. We worked on, um, on pushing the United States to, to make space for fair elections, to support human rights. Uh, we, we, also started working on U.S. immigration policies, and in part because it became clear that a lot of the immigration crises for, for the crises for Haitians in the United States had their roots in the policies that we were fighting back in Haiti. Um, a lot of people had, had fled because of uh, U.S. support for, for uh, repressive regimes and U.S. undermining of successful democratic regimes. There were lots of people who were uh, fleeing to the United States just because they needed to, to eat. And, and um, one of the main causes of that was U.S. aid policies. And uh, President Clinton actually, I think in, in, a, in a very uh, courageous admission, admitted that he had made a devil's bargain when he was president, that he had, in order to support Arkansas rice farmers, he had forced Haiti to, to lower its trade barriers to U.S. rice. And U.S. rice is you know, it's very efficient, it's very large scale, it's also highly subsidized. And Haitian rice, which isn't large scale and isn't subsidized, couldn't compete. And immediately, Haitian rice farmers were out of business. Haiti's food security became dependent on the United States, and that created a lot of, a lot of dislocation and poverty and misery, as, as President Clinton admitted. So we were working on trade policies to try to make sure that the U.S. gave Haiti a chance to, to develop economically and to maintain its its business and, and maintain its its economy. Um, we're also working on things like temporary protected status, um, which was which is given to people from uh, countries that that are suffering from either human or 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 uh, natural disasters. And in Haiti, it was a combination of both. Uh, the, the TPS was granted because of Haiti's earthquake, and you know the earth shook the ground in Haiti. Uh, you know, it was the plates that shook the ground that created the earthquake, but it was really Haiti's lack of resiliency and lack of government capacity that led to most of the deaths and displace, displacement in Haiti. Uh, the size of Haiti's earthquake was one that created minimal dislocation in, in other places that had the same size earthquake, but because Haiti had been rendered vulnerable, um, and in large part by U.S. policies, it had an outsized uh, outsized reaction and people were forced to, to seek safety in the United States. Um, wh while we were working on, on these, um, these issues, it became clear that these things were, these policies were being applied to Haiti, but we also noticed they were being applied uh, so many else, so many other places in the world. And I'm sure Dr. Cabrera can, can talk about, you know, all over her field of work uh, that, that, that the same policies keep, keep popping up. And we started thinking, well, why are we responding in a siloed way? So, you know, Haiti's the Haiti people are supporting, are, are, are responding through their channels and the Nicaragua people are going through their channels and Mexico people are going through their channels and everybody's 
having a siloed response to a syst systematic policy. And none of us were having much success. And, and it was pretty clear that one of the reasons was the fact that we weren't able to have a unified success. And we tried, through IJDH, we tried to, um, we tried to create alliances and tried to, tried to broaden the platform. Uh, but it was really difficult and it's kind of complicated why. I mean, some of it was just because everybody was so busy responding to, you know, whatever emergency happened the day before. Uh, but I think there were also dynamics within the funding sector, within the foreign policy sector, and within organizational dynamics and, and sort of the structure of how advocacy gets done that limited people's ability to work together on common programs. Um, so a year ago, I left IGDH. It was kind of it was time to turn the organization over and uh, we're especially excited that we turned it over to to a Haitian, a young Haitian woman leader. Um, and so I decided to try to start Project Blueprint, uh, which our goal is to try to help nurture these collaborations across issues. So help help groups to 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 connect the dots, both in terms of domestic policy and international policy, but also to get all the people that are affected by the same policies to, to work together so we can have a more effective response. Um, and the Project Blueprint's particular angle is we, we are a, um, a collaboration of organizations that are based in the US, so we have some US advocacy capacity. But we also work directly on the ground with people who are impacted by US policy. So we try to bring the perspectives of people who really know the consequences of US policy and get them into places where decisions about those people's rights are made. Uh, and one of, one of the examples of the, of the type of work we do is an op-ed that we got published in the Miami Herald in March. Uh, we thought it was a great time to get it, to get it published because it was just before the, the Florida primary. It was also right the same day that COVID really broke as a huge story in Florida. And you know, it's been like so many other of our issues, it's been eclipsed ever since. Uh, but it's a good example of kind of how we can go about doing it. Um, we, we call our, our way of working, or we like to analogize to a soccer game. Uh, you know, we have someone who shoots the goal and gets the credit. And in this Miami Herald article, it was, um, it was Salvador Sarmiento, who's with one of our advisory, uh, advisory board organizations, the um, National Day Laborers Organizing Network, as well as Paul Mondesir, a Haitian activist with uh, American Friends Service Committee. And they get the credit for scoring the goal. Um, but we passed it around among our team to try to get it there. And so we passed it to our, our, our Haiti group, which is my former organization, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti. They added their perspective. Uh, Madre added the perspective of, of women. Uh, Partners in Health added the perspective of global health. Center for Economic and Policy Research added some of their aid and trade expertise. And so together we created this, this op-ed that we hope connected the dots among among all our work. And you can see it on our website, which is, which is uh, Project Blueprint, or sorry, you can Google Project Blueprint, but the website is blueprint2021.org. Um, and uh, back a few months ago, I was introduced through some mutual friends to Yvette and to, to Lola Ibrahim, who's the uh, MIRR Alliance uh, Executive Director. And we started talking about how we might collaborate because like, like Blueprint, MIR Alliance, by its name, um, you know, is trying to connect the dots and trying to work collectively with people. And we thought that the that, that op-ed would be a good place to collaborate, uh, to start our collaboration. We decided to launch this discussion. So I guess I've closed that that trajectory to the conversation, and uh, I'll pass it on to pass pass the baton back to Yvette. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, you underlined many in many times uh, that it is collaboration. Thank you. Again, folks, um, if you have any questions, you can add them to the chat box. And uh, we're going to move on to Guadalupe, who already has a question for Brian, I think. And uh, so we'll, let me introduce her before she speaks. And again, Dr. Guadalupe Correa Cabrera is Associate Professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Her areas of expertise are Mexico-US relations, organized crime, immigration, border security, social movements, and human trafficking. Her newest book is titled Los Zetas Incorporated, Criminal Corporations, Energy, and Civil War in Mexico. 
And Guadalupe is past president of the Association of Borderland Studies, and she is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Guadalupe, would you, are you give us your first remarks? Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the invitation by the MIR Alliance uh, in collaboration with Project Blueprint. This is a very important conversation. I think that this needs just to be the beginning because this, this, this important subject needs to be developed and discussed further in different fora. And um, well, I would like to in introduce myself a little bit and my work that allowed me to see things in a, in a different way. I lived in Brownsville, Texas for eight years and conducted research on first on human, uh, sorry, drug trafficking organizations and drug smuggling. And in, in, during that period, I realized that due to the policies and the uh, border security collaboration between Mexico and the United States, people were put in a situation, uh, particularly because of the policies that were decided in Washington DC and Mexico City, people were put in a situation where, where they were displaced from the countries of origin and were not allowed to go anywhere. And that was desperate. And that fueled violence in so many ways. Uh, last week, and um, Yvette was present, we had an, an, an event trying to explain the, um, the phenomenon of the of Central American gangs and immigration and the US rhetoric in the context of the US election. And how young people that had not had any opportunity without taking responsibility out of themselves, but in reality, a problem that has driven a lot of people from their home and, and have been, uh, I mean, displacing people from the home, violence. Violence is, is, a, is a very important uh, problem here that displays uh, communities from different countries. And they, where they look for home, they look for home uh, at places that are more developed, uh, safer, and that provide up economic opportunities. And this is something that has more problematized in not just in the Americas, but also in Europe. I mean, in the whole world, these mass mobilizations of people, mass movements of people, migrant caravans in the Americas, and the refugee crisis uh, that started in Europe, actually, those phenomena are very, are very similar in, in, in a lot of respects. And, 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 the, and the basic, I mean, the, the, the foundations on the, the explanation of why people leave their home, because they cannot live there. And a lot of this has to do with armed conflict. And what happened in the Americas that have driven people mainly in the beginning uh, from Mexico and then from Central America. And in the year 2019, we realized that people from other countries, uh, transcontinental migration from the African continent, Southeast Asia, they started to arrive to different parts of the hemisphere and, 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 and started to go and, and, and take a very dangerous journey to the United States. And the doors of the United States were closed. So many people started to discuss why, why this has been happening? And some of them put just attention on US foreign policies. It, it's, it's historic, it's a, it's a historic phenomenon. And, uh, and these policies are not policies of building a wall today. That complicates a lot of uh, conditions. Uh, border enforcement done in certain ways in collaboration with governments and also um, connected with corrupt processes in the countries of origin. That really, really difficult. Uh, what, what is happening now. Um, for example, let's remember that uh, during the Cold War, the United States had a policy that is connected with the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and this is the way that Latin Americans perceive this, right? The intervention of the United States to exercise control over the hemisphere have caused a lot of problems in different countries. I'm talking in particular um, about countries like Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, with all the authoritarian regimes that were imposed and were supported by the United States with the intention of, uh, of, of controlling the region in, in a period of Cold War. And what happened in Central America? Also, the intervention of the United States and support of particular political groups and, and, and that, that derived into civil wars during this process. 
people had to leave their places, had to go to the United States. Refugees were, were escaping this, 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 this very substantial amount of violence, had to flee from their home with their kids, had to work uh, very, I mean, you know, long hours in the United States. And they were not able to take care of their kids. The kids were there under conditions that, that were very, I mean, they, they stayed very vulnerable and they had to be in the street. And so they met the gangs, and gangs were forming the United States during this period. That was that was a process, a uh, very complex process that had to do with this violence that where they were um, living, and and the responsibility of the United States is there. We cannot we cannot forget about that. And once they were there, once they had to that went way in the streets when that they they met the gangs there they had to defend themselves uh against the gangs that were in, in in that were living in their communities and they formed gangs and then they were deported massively to their countries of origin countries that they didn't know and countries that didn't have institutions after the after the after the civil war the countries that didn't give them opportunities and 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 with the corruption with it's a very complex process where they kind of were able to find in a gang a type of family a type of way of surviving and living and hurting others poor people hurting other people this is what the gang model is about uh, I have been able to uh, identify these factors by going to these places and by traveling along the migration route for, for a number of years and understanding this from a different perspective. We have many responsibilities, different actors have responsibilities. What happened when they were there? The governments in these countries didn't give opportunities to their people, to their youth either, or constructing uh, or, or building institutions that, that solve the problems and the foundations. What are the root causes of this problem? They didn't solve it. They just sent people to the prisons and with the corruption, with the massive corruption, with the, with the control, that the gangs exercised in, co in collaboration with corrupt authorities allowed this project to expand. And this project expanding, gangs operating, the leaders operating within the prisons and giving orders outside. So gang members outside were receiving, re receiving orders from prisons and many people were not able to leave. Many people that we are observing right now, applying for asylum, asking for asylum, leaving their countries from Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador are part of this process. They, they cannot uh, I mean, they cannot complete their, their goals and they cannot uh, make a living because they have to pay war tax. They have to pay extortion fee to the gangs. They, they, their kids are recruited. The kids are, are, are dead. But this is a more complex process where we cannot blame a sing, uh, just one, a, a single group. And that has uh, combined with, with other, other policies that, that put more people at, at risk. Uh, the passage of the migration protection protocols or stay in Mexico program that was imposed on Mexico by the United States in this in this in the present administration um, in order to solve supposedly the problem for the US but it's not solving the problem for the US people are staying in Mexico they are, are applying for asylum they are not able to do that in which conditions they are staying at the border in Mexico without jobs or somebody else can provide by them with jobs like organized crime, uh, human trafficking or human smugglers, they can form part of those criminal networks. And that's going to be a risk in the future for the United States too. So there is a need to address these issues. Uh, I mean, what are the root causes? And there needs to be, to be a recognition of a shared responsibility and providing opportunities for people to develop safely in their communities. I am sure, and I am a, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant in the United States. I am sure that people would like to live in their countries, to talk, uh, to, to speak their language, to be with their with their with their families. See, we had an opportunity in our countries, but not not necessarily we have those opportunities. And I'm sure that we can all contribute with policies that are that are that are better designed to to I mean to to help in this. It's not about helping the people; it's helping all of us because. Those who are right now in Mexico waiting for an opportunity can become part of the problem too, joining gangs or joining cartels or joining uh, groups that, that will put their families at risk and all the countries at risk. So let's, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to, to spend so much time talking about this. We can, we can, we can discuss a lot of things, but I, I just want to put that on the table. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. No, those are important issues that people should have an incentive to stay at home, that, that they have security, that their countries have resilience to be able to respond to natural disasters, as Brian mentioned. And that is a win-win solution for everyone, of course. So we have a lot of questions coming in, but I, <clears throat> I have a couple that I would like to ask, excuse me. Brian, you mentioned some of the um, actions and as you have also Guadalupe and foreign, foreign policy that have caused um, problems and, and caused people to want to leave their countries and, and not be able to even to stay and to sustain themselves in their countries. And, you, and Brian, you talked about the issue of collaboration between organizations and advocacy can, do you have any examples that you have seen where this type of collaboration to make changes in policy have worked? Some examples that we might want to um, expand upon, replicate? Brian, you are on mute. Brian, you're on mute. <laughs> you're both, but Guadalupe, yeah. you are as well. I think one policy that, that, that it didn't quite work, but it's, I think it's a promise promising example of what can work was the effort um, a little bit less than a year ago to stop U.S. support for the war in Yemen. Um, you know, the war in Yemen, both in terms of people killed by war and people killed by disease attributable to the war is just, you know, it's just off the charts horrible. And we're not currently um, feeling the impacts here in the United States because we don't allow people in from Yemen. Um, it's part of the Muslim ban, but, but it's, you know, it's obviously killing people by the hundreds of thousands and, and generating lots of, lots of refugees. And we're supporting it by, by supporting Saudi Arabia's attacks. Um, back at the end of last year, um, a, a, a bunch of progressive groups got together and, and tried to figure out how they could do this. And they worked with, um, with Senator Sanders to create a um, to kind of cr create a resolution invoking the war powers resolution to try to push the um, to, to, to say that that the war could not continue without without a, without support from Congress which it had never had um, they were able to work with with you know, first they started off working along among organizations on the left and created sort of a, a pretty strong platform one that would not have by itself gotten anything passed by the Senate. But then they reached out to, to a broader group of people who, had, who had shared a similar interest. And some of it was, was religious conservatives so who had their, you know, their own reasons for, for opposing the slaughter. Some were, were people who just felt that the US needed to have, have a more modest foreign policy and, and, and be less interventionist. And they were able to create a, um, enough of a, of, a, of a coalition in Congress. And it was sort of a, you know, the, without the middle of the spectrum, it was kind of the left and the right sides of the spectrum that, that were able to get the resolution passed through Congress. It ended up the President Trump um, vetoed it. And, you know, they didn't have the power to, to, to overcome the veto. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a promise of the type of thing that, that, that can happen. And perhaps there will be opportunities for that under the new administration. And I think we should all look for those opportunities. I mean, there's, you know, there's obviously lots of division going on as, um, and I think that there's, you know, some of those divisions are for good reasons. There are serious disagreements over, over, over policy, but I think we all should look for opportunities with people that we, if we share uh, at least part of an, part of an objective that we try to find ways to work together to, to, to make a difference. Guadalupe, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think that uh, that you know initiatives or I, I think efforts that that are that can can help us to to solve this situation. I, I want I want to talk about two things. Uh, one problem that we have observed with regards to immigration or migration in our hemisphere, uh, one thing has to do with the regularization of the situation within the United States. And that has not been solved. And there have been a lot of efforts on paper, bipartisan efforts, I, I mean, to really pass a comprehensive immigration reform. That would benefit everybody and that would make the governments working, on, I mean, on the, on the, I mean in, their own, in their own spaces. 
um, to facilitate, um, you know, a more regular flow of people where and 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 people staying at their their home. So I believe that on paper we have a very good proposal that has been, you know, redeveloped. Um, by bipartisan uh, actors, which is, is important. It's not the initiative of one government, the initiative of President Barack Obama. No, it's, it's an initiative made in Congress and by senators. In 2013, the Senate come up, came, came up with a, with a very interesting proposal to, to, to solve the situation in the United States with immigrants that are already here that live undocumented. And that puts them at risk particular women of domestic violence, they cannot report the violence they are subject to when, when they don't have a regularized situation. And also the abuses, also even human trafficking cases that take place that we don't really know. And people don't, don't report that just because of their situation, their passports are taken away from them. It's just a comp very complicated situation within the United States. Enforcement has been done, but people are continuing arriving. And they are not stopping. With enforcement, what has happened is that, this, that the migrant smuggling networks have become much better organized, more sophisticated. And if you have the money, you will pay and they will take you to the United States. But the conditions of, I mean, the, your working conditions are, are terrible. And we have to understand that. And for that, I believe the comprehensive, a comprehensive immigration reform that that will solve the situations here in the state is very here in the states it's very important. Another thing is all those that are that are coming from from different countries, from Central America, uh, from from uh, from other countries, transcontinental migration from from Africa, uh, from the African continent, from Southeast Asia. How to deal with this? Um, you know, in the year 2000, uh, the Mexican president and, and, the, and the U.S. president, George W. Bush and Vicente Fox, came together and were talking about uh, migration agreement. When the, the countries were sitting and, and trying to, to deal with these issues together. And there were, there were, they were talking about money for development. Uh, in Mexico to to develop the southern border, for example, that was also an initiative that was uh, that during the transition period in the year 2018 was sent to President Trump by President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Okay, I I can deal with this. I just need some resources to develop projects in southern Mexico and and you know aid for development in in Central America. It's 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 particularly important to deal with this issue not just in a more humane way. We're, we have to deal with this protecting human rights. The situation right now, it's a disaster and it's going to become more disastrous because of COVID-19. The conditions, the economic conditions, the economic crisis, all the countries in the world are living. It's just going to difficult the, the, the situation. So if we don't work together, if we don't collaborate together, you just blame either the United States or the corrupt governments in Central America or the xenophobic government of Mexico that don't accept and it's treating migrants the same way. If we spend time on that and do not create, uh, I mean, conditions. But I think that many people have talked about that. Talking about immigration agreement, talking about comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, it's an effort by those who, who think about this, this, this possibility. This. I think I think the solutions are already on the table. It's just like the political wheel. I mean, politicians need to go and need to further this. It's 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 a complex uh, problem, but we all need to work together. And it's a transnational effort that we have to think about. Well, certainly, certainly, that we go back to that collaboration, the building of coalitions. And we talked a lot about um, influencing U.S. U.S. policy. Um, but we've talked also in U.S. policy in terms of movement to our borders. We, and Brian has talked about what, what is happening in Yemen and how U.S. policy has an, an impact there in the, in the region on the, the need for Ye Yemenis to, to leave there. But we also have in the region, you spoke to Central America, but we also see the outflow in Venezuela. Do you have any comments on, because that is a major issue right now, the movement of people from Venezuela. 
that's a major issue. And that does not only have to do with US foreign policy, that also has to do with more complex geopolitical processes that are right now going on. And we need to consider that uh, we cannot talk about immigration without, without acknowledging the role of countries like Russia or China in the hemisphere. And that's, that complicates the situation. What has happened in Venezuela is not just uh, I mean, a, a result of an authoritarian regime that, that has abused its people. It's just much, much more complex. The possibility that this is happening has to do with the involvement of other countries in, in the hemisphere too. So um, in, in this regard, uh, I, I don't think that the solution has been arrived in this, in, this, in, this, in this way. Colombia has done a lot for, I mean, to solve the situation and accepting immigrants, but at the same time, communities are getting tired and they are kind of like, uh, rejecting right now the, the further arrival of people from Venezuela and the countries around. And also because COVID has changed the, all these things. Even before COVID, uh, borders were being closed in different countries of that region to Venezuelans. And what is going to happen if this, if, if, this is, if this is the case? Migrant smuggling networks, again, are going to continue operating much better, organizing better, and provide a way. People have to leave those, those conditions. So what is going to happen in this case is much more complicated. Uh, is the United States going to intervene military? Uh, in, in, I mean, a military intervention could cause a lot of uh, lives, uh, I mean, lost. So that's why I, I don't think that anybody has really acted upon what is happening in the country. It's a very complex situation, but also political will to do this in a way that don't uh, affect more people, right? And other countries also need to, I mean, to have a different approach towards immigration from Venezuela. At this time, uh, Colombia is a country that has taken the burden. And I don't believe that, that, uh, that the United States has had a, a more specific direction in terms of its policy with Venezuelans. Venezuelans are at limbo right now in that regard. So it is, it is in the hands of politicians right now at many levels to to help in that in that uh, I mean in, in that problem. Uh, this is the this I mean, you know, the manifestation of this with regards to the to the movement of, of people is is worrisome, but at the same time, the geopolitical consequences of these are are tremendous. So it's also like a conversation that we can have in in a couple of days or more. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah. And I, um, I saw that in in front, I, I, I failed to give a little bit more about your background. I know that you have a comment to make and I want to invite you to make it first. I, I want to just tell a little bit more uh, um, to our audience here about you again. Indran Amir Yagam is a poet and um, he read to us a poem of, of the migrant's reply at the beginning. And as I mentioned that he was born in Sri Lanka and he's a migrant himself. But just to let you know that uh, Indran writes poetry in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole. He has lived uh, a number of years in Haiti himself. And he has published 19 poetry collections, including The Migrant States, which he read, which he read from. And he's also, um, he's also a musician, and he recorded Francon Dut. He edits the Beltway Poetry Qu Quarterly and writes a blog and writes a poem every week for Haiti en Marche. And he is a 2020 Foundation for the Contemporary Arts Fellow in Poetry. Now, Indrid, I know that you had a comment about the discussion. Please, um, you're on mute. <laughs> you are on mute. Um, Lola, do you need to take him off mute? There we go. Yeah. OK, I'm off mute now. Yeah. Yes. Th thank you. Sorry. And thank you for that lo those lovely introduction. Yeah. Uh, you know, the question that occurs to me listening and, and thinking about uh, the United States and, and Latin America and its relationship to the rest of the world and is how do we restore the idea of the U.S. as a model, you know, in terms of transparent systems, a civil, not politicized civil service, for example. Um, is it only about the election, about who wins this election coming up on November 3rd? Or is, it, or is the U.S. going through a larger, broader crisis of belief in its institutions of getting a fair deal from them, you know, whether it's Congress or whether it's the, the justice system, the police, um, the police, the, uh, you name it, the postal service, the, 
Uh, and then, so where do we begin in terms of if if you if we agree that there is this crisis of confidence, first of all, do we is that is that is that a true a fair statement? And if it is, then how do we as individuals begin to uh, help restore that confidence? And how do we and as members in groups and and do you know and just I'd love to hear comments and the other panelists uh, reflect on these questions. How do we restore that confidence? But I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank I don't you. have an answer yet. <laughs> Brian, do you want to start it with a response? Um, yeah, I guess I'd start with, with the question Indran posed in his poem about what happened to kindness of strangers. Um, you know, I think at some level, I mean, the easy, the low hanging fruit on this is, yes, of course, we have to correct some of the worst, the most abusive policies of the last three or four years. And that's, I mean, it's, it's low hanging fruit, but some of that is going to take a lot of time. Um, our allies are not going to trust us because, you know, this was the result of a long process that we didn't stop. And they have, it's going to take some time for them to develop confidence that it's not going to happen again. Um, but I think we also have to make longer term term changes. I mean, I think that I think it's clear that kindness to strangers is is not is not a, a universally shared um, moral standing of the government. I mean, we're we're putting kids in cages separating families and there's, you know, there's an outcry from some people, but it's, it's far from, far from universal. And I think some of that is, so, so this goes back to I, what both of us, both, both Dr. Cabrera and I have talked about is, is correcting some of the longer term problems with U.S. foreign policy. And it's not like we've, you know, we're in a garden of Eden until, until, until three years ago and, and, and we've been thrown out. Um, I think that you know things that we need to do. One of them is we need to have a much more diverse set of voices in these conversations. Uh, it's really exciting to me to to, to be part of, of of a diverse and consequently very interesting discussion. Uh, but I bet you know I bet and and it's really exciting to see that you know Yvette had a long career in government. That Indran's part of the government. But I'm sure Yvette can tell you know years worth of stories of being in a room where it's all white men, where her perspective was perhaps the most useful, but the least listened to. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Cabrera can still say that, and Indra can still say that, hopefully less than, you know, at the beginning of, of, of Yvette's career. Uh, you know, I think we should recognize the progress that's made, but I think we also need to commit to to making more progress until we, until we have um, a, discussion, both in terms of government service, but also academia and NGO perspective, that both reflects America, but is also diverse enough to be useful because it's, you know, it's common sense. It's also scientifically proven that the more diversity of voices you get, the better results you get from those discussions. And I think we need, we need, we need to do that. Um, and, you know, another way of kind of, that people have addressed this issue is talking about this thing they call the blob, which is a, a it, which is the, often the foreign policy blob, and it's described as kind of a, a triangle with, with the, the, the points are with government, think tanks, and universities, and, and people go among those three, and it's usually just a few universities that, that produce the people that are doing foreign policy, and they go to the same jobs in government, and think tanks, and kind of circle around without getting a lot of information that is that is uh, critical of their worldview. And we obviously need to, need to break that. Um, you know, just one kind of example, and uh, you know, it's easy to criticize the Trump administration, but the Obama administration, if you look at, for example, um, the, 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 the bombing of Libya, that was by you know, humanitarian standards, legal standards, economic standards, governance was a total failure, almost with very little opposition when it was being implemented. Um, certainly not for mainstream foreign policy, which said, oh, of course, it's a good idea for the U.S. to, you know, to, to bomb a country without any legal, legal justification. Um, we need to be able to have voices in the room at all levels that are going to, are going to question that. We have um, many questions in the chat, and we're getting short on time.
So I want to start pulling up some of those questions. And um, to start, we have a question uh, for Brian about function and responsibilities. Does the Institute for the Justice of Democracy in Haiti have that are overlapping with a uh, blueprint? Uh, yeah, and, and to find out more about Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, I encourage people to, to go to the website, which is ijdh.org. But basically what, what IJDH is trying to do is to bring the Haitian people's fight for justice and democracy to the United States. And what Blueprint is trying to do is to, is to internationalize that, to kind of put together the voices of people who are doing that for Haiti, with the voices of people who are doing that for Central America, for poor countries in Africa, for similarly situated countries in Asia, all over the world. So you get, you get people who are working on similar problems to respond in a, in a, in a collaborative, coordinated voice so that we, you know, just, I'll, I'll say it in, a, in, a, in terms of a Haitian proverb, which is men on pil shai palu, many hands make the load light. And I think we, you know, have an extremely heavy load to carry in terms of having a better U.S. foreign policy. Um, and the only way we're going to carry that load is with many hands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lupe. There's a question here, and, and this is to both of you, but we'll, it, we'll stop with you. Can you outline macro political strategies for the U.S. to reverse historical, uh, these historical policy patterns that have caused problems that, in both populations in the region and, and elsewhere in the world, and key alliances that we might focus on? Absolutely. I think that uh, macro strategies, this needs to be reversed in some form, right? An intervention at some point in time, deportation policies, and also this attitude against Latin America that it's, it's, it's first, America first and everybody else uh, second. Like, you know, the imposition of, uh, I mean, when, when migration protection protocols was accepted by Mexico after you, after the threat of, of imposing uh, tariffs on our products uh, to the United, uh, our exports to the United States. That's not the way to do things. And I'm not talking about some, I mean, beyond the morality or the ethical issues that we can conceive here, but what macro strategies, uh, I mean, can be applied to, to deal with the historical uh, responsibilities of the United States. And this is where, development aid is at the center. I understand that this is a long-term process and it's providing money uh, with any limitation or, or, or with any thoughts on which projects are going to be developed. It's a very complex decision to make, particularly in countries that are also living very complicated political processes and, and because of some leaderships are, are, are also connected with with, with pretty bad actors, uh, allegedly. I, I, I am not, I'm not pointing out specific, specific countries, but I'm thinking about Venezuela, I'm thinking about Honduras in some ways, and, uh, and I'm thinking about El Salvador in, in, in many other ways. I, I can think about a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with the governments in, in Latin America. But I think there needs to be, this trust needs to be built again. So, so and, and there needs to be uh, efforts to their direct aid in a way that it's more plausible, it's more viable, and, and also stopping uh, intervening militarily or, or placing more forces, military forces in the Americas. Right now, with, the, with what's happening in Mexico, with the arrest of the, foreign, uh, of the former uh, head of uh, the Secretariat of Defense, there, there are, there's some voices in the United States talking about the possible, um, you know, more direct intervention because Mexico cannot be trusted. And the, I mean, naming uh, Mexican cartels, narco-terrorist groups would probably involve further uh, inter military intervention in Mexico or, or approaches that are not very good for people and that will cause further military problems. So continuing with that, those attitudes, continuing with this militaristic perspective on the hemisphere might cause more problems that will lead us to uh, humanitarian catastrophes. And right now with COVID-19, this is very dangerous. So yes, but we have to, I mean, in this conversation, we cannot talk about all the, the, the complexities and in many levels, what, what those strategies can, 
can, uh, can incorporate. But I think we need to talk about that in different fora, and it's very important. It can be done. And, and, con and considering the, the mistakes of the past, we can go to a better present uh, altogether. Thank you. If I, if I could add to that, uh, so just one, one, one thing to add, I think that that's important from a US political perspective is one of the things we need to do is to abolish the, the, the silo between of foreign policy and domestic policy. Um, I think that that, that that separation was intentionally put in as a way to wall off most Americans from policies that really affect them in a daily life, to convince them that these policies don't affect them. You know, one example from our work in Haiti, uh, the US government is very aggressive in keeping Haiti from raising its minimum wage. And, you know, the reality is there's a limited set of people in the United States who are gonna get excited about Haiti's minimum wage. But if, they're, if it's explained to them that the reason why minimum wages are kept low in Haiti and Honduras and Pakistan and so many other places is so that wages in, in Pennsylvania are kept low, then that will get people to understand how this impacts them. And I think as, as advocates, we need to make sure that we, we abolish that, that distinction so we can explain to Americans why this is important to them in their daily lives. Thank you. The next question, um, assuming that Joe Biden wins, we are assuming that immigration reform will get more attention, well, certainly that it hasn't had in the last four years. What, should you, what do you see as what Biden's goal should be? The comment here is that Biden's goal will be to fix the situation, but given the complexity of immigration laws and policy, it's difficult. What would you want to see addressed first? Now, among those, there's DACA, asylum reform, refugee, the refugee program that needs to be reinstituted, enforcement issues by ICE and CBP. Well, and a lot of, I mean, there's a long list of policies that this administration has enacted that um, need to be addressed. And I'll just say from having been in government, it is very complicated. And even some of the comments that you've made about domestic and foreign policy, um, it, it's, it, immigration is such a mixture of that, actually. It has such an impact on both sides. Um, and Indra has a comment on this. Yeah, I'll just start very briefly and then leave it to my colleagues to, to the first thing that I think about is, is the border and these refugee camps, you know, and all of the abuses that are taking, that are going on in the, uh, where these people are waiting and waiting and waiting all these months. And we have to fix on the first day uh, what, uh, as uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, no, have no longer these people being stopped on the bridge from being able to go into the States and, and make their asylum claim, for example. Um, a, a huge publicity operation to refurbish the image of our border patrol and our and ICE, uh, ICE and so on, all of these things, because I, these are all good people. They're fellow members of the American community and they too need to, but they need uh, guidance, a different set of guidelines and a different, uh, and, and apply those new. I mean, these are just, just thoughts that come to mind. Uh, and I'll stop there, go ahead. And I think this, that is important too, when the humanitarian aspect of immigration has been so downplayed in these recent years, that needs to be uh, elevated once again. And Guadalupe, you have a comment? Yes, I have a comment on, uh, from the perspective of, um, you know, internal immigration. And, and I think that Joe Biden said something very important, and I hope that he keeps his promise. And that has, that's the beginning to solve, and to, to solve the, the comprehensive problem that, I mean, immigration system in the United States, we all know and we can all recognize that it's broken. But one of the first steps that need to be done here is also to take people from the shadows in the United States and, and, and providing um, those for a path towards citizenship. It's, I mean, beyond DACA, beyond DACA, because people have lived here, have made America great. They will, come, they, will, they, will, they, will, they will perform better. They will continue making this country better. But, and, but they, they you need to regularize the situation of those who are here and documented. And that would also, uh, this is a, the initial point where, uh, I mean, smuggling networks would have 
different incentives. And it's not just stopping people at the border, but making this more regular, uh, making this legal. Uh, what are the needs of the United States? It's, it's more profitable for companies in the United States to continue employing workers and paying them very little. I, I mean, everybody has to pay a price for this, right? And making them uh, citizens or providing them with a path towards citizenship, increasing the number of, of, um, of uh, uh, visas, temporary visas a way to match the demand and the supply of, of, of labor. So I, I believe that this should be a priority, uh, the path towards citizenship to those who have lived their lives in the, civil, in the, in the United States. Brian, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, you, you, know, you asked us to kind of say, which of the things do we have to do first? And I'm going to join the other panelists by saying everything. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it just is. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's all of these, as both Indran and Dr. Cabrera have mentioned are so intertwined that you sort of, you know, we can't pick off a couple of things. One example is, you know, the, 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 when we're talking about family separation now, one of the things that the Trump administration says is, well, the Obama administration started that. And there's not a lot of truth to that, but there's some. And, and what the truth in it is that in response to a big influx of refugees, um, the, the, they started to try to um, detain people because they felt there was too many people getting uh, released into the country and they started building some of these facilities. They did not, I mean, cruelty was not the point as it is now, uh, but I think there was incidental cruelty, not nearly at the current levels, but some incidental cruelty that was created. The underlying problem was, and certainly the, you know, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration could have done better jobs, but the basic problem was the generation of all those refugees coming to the border. And unless we fix that, while we fix what's going on inside the country, while we regularize the system, um, we're not going to have a solution. One, one I think, initiative that, that I find uh, personally promising is the Migrant Justice Project. Um, and it's, it's Migrant Justice, the no, Migrant Justice Platform. And I'll, I'll type it into the chat. It's migrantjusticeplatform.org. And they try to bring in all these strands together. They try to have a, a unified program that includes worker protection in the U.S. And, and in neighboring countries for both documented and undocumented people. It includes trying to reduce immigration pressure. It includes having a fair system and supporting people in their homes. And I really think we need to look at it at that kind of concrete level. And I also think we have an opportunity to do that. I, mean, I think that, the, that the, the stars are aligning both in terms of the political opportunities and the political organizing to make that work. Thank you. just want to um, read a comment um, from Rick Swartz that, that kind of underlines that nexus between foreign and domestic policy when it comes to migration, immigration to the United States, because immigrants, as this comment reads, Immigrants have always revitalized the American character for 400 years in peace and war from the bottom up. And that is an important part, even when we look at domestic policy, how important immigration is really to our economy. And uh, thank you for adding that, Brian, migrantjusticeplatform.org, the organization that you were just speaking about. This is, um, we're at the last call for questions because we're getting to the closing. And, um, but before we do that, um, I'm going to invite Indran to read another of his poems that I think that elucidates our discussion. And Indran, if you would introduce your poem for us and read it. Thank you. Thank you. I, actually, I'm going to read, if I may, two short poems related to each other. They come from a section of the book that has to do with Haiti um, because um, it just happened. It, for me, Haiti is an American space, just like Colombia is an American space. Argentina is an American space, and the United States is an American space. This is all America, and we need to talk to each other and care about, you know, for each other. This poem is called Injustice. To know this country, when you palaver with people in the street, you will discover all kinds of lies, histories, and certainly those who've experienced dictatorship and afterwards leadership by a priest, a musician, paradise or carnival, while the international community tries to understand with a belt tightening plan what escapes like a plastic bag 
into the sea. So, and then on a more sort of hopeful note in a way, uh, a poem called The Avocado Season is Over. The season of avocados is over. The most beautiful girl in town is about to marry a man across the water. My brother is busy with his manuscript. Time to share ideas in a book has gone to the country without a hat. Accept reality. Don't live any more in fantasy. You are getting along in years, but have only spoken Creole for two. You have a great long life ahead. Think, reflect, tell all the new families, congratulations, good luck. Then write again about your life in Haiti when the avocado was in bloom. Um, I'll stop there. But the avocado will, will bloom again, you know, yeah. and in America. <laughs> So thank you, thank you. We have received one more question, and I think with with this uh, Guadalupe and Brian, um, your response to this, and then your any closing remarks that you have, I invite you to give at the same time. So uh, the question is, what would happen? What would you expect to happen under four more years of Trump? And do Trump policies isolate America? And how do you see how it changes? How it changes our standing on the world stage? Um. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, President Trump has made throughout his, you know, his campaign in 2016 and his current campaign and throughout his presidency <clears throat> has made promises about where immigration policy would go and has kept them. Um, I expect that, <clears throat> that they would continue to be worse. Just last night, um, the United States, they, they, overnight they issued a memorandum that they're cutting the refugee um, level down to, I think it's 10,000. Uh, sorry, 15,000 for next year, the lowest, lowest in over a century for the United States. And, um, you know, those things are going to continue. Uh, the, the, the TPS will be canceled. DACA, people benefiting from DACA and, and DREAMers are going to lose their status and be deported. Uh, and I think that is going to lead to, to a continued decrease in our standing in the world. Any other comments too that you want to add in closing before Guadalupe? Um, yeah, so I guess I should follow up on the on the on the you know the somewhat negative assessment. I mean, I still think we have great opportunities. One of the things, one of the, the challenges that when we discuss, as we I think I think it's been a really interesting discussion about about the complexity and the and the scale of the problem. It's easy to 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 look at that and say. Well, there's nothing that I can do as, a, as an individual to, to make a difference here. And if you said that, for most of us, you'd be right. There is nothing we can do as an individual. But going back to the Haitian proverb of Mena Pilashai Palu, there's lots we can do as members of organizations. So I would encourage people to, to join an organization. Um, Mir Alliance has a mailing list. Project Blueprint has a mailing list on our websites. Um, and find an organization that speaks to you and, and uh, support it. Support it with, with, with money. Every little bit helps for small organizations. Support it with your time. Support it any way you can. And what I would just recommend that when you're looking for an organization to support, look at one that is working collaboratively and look at one that's dealing with the complexity of the whole ecosystem of migration and is, and is looking for sustainable solutions to the roots of the problems, not just looking at the, at the symptoms. Carlupe, the same question to you about the standing of the U.S. In, in the world under Trump policies, especially in the area of immigration, and your closing remarks. Absolutely. Um, in the year 2016, when the campaign was going on, and when all the proposals by the current president were, were, were put on the table, I, I did believe that that was not possible, that that was not going to happen, that a wall was, was, was impossible to build, a big, beautiful wall from, from east, to, east to west. And uh, what, what happened, um, the Migration uh, Policy Institute put together a fantastic and very worrisome report on all the policies that have been uh, implemented in the past three and some years. And the problem is that to, I mean, this, there are so many, and all of them are not decided in Congress with, I mean, with consensus in the country, right? So, but at the same time, just reversing this is going to be very difficult. We know, we know who the president is, we know 
where his priorities are, he has shown us exactly what is going to happen and when it's going to continue happening. And with that being said, in 2016, when he referred to Mexicans as rapers, as criminals, and he referred to Mexicans as bad hombres and wanting to go with, with, with his people to, to solve the problem of Mexicans, I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't doubt that, that this is going to continue, it's going to become worse. And the division within the country that I'm observing, that I have observed in the past few years, it's, it's incredible. The United States has lost its stand as, as, as a world leader, in, in, I mean, as a world leader. That's the way that I see it. And within the country, the, the generation of divisions is just so important uh, that, that a country like, like the United States cannot continue to be uh, a world power if, if it continues. And it's not only about immigration, it's about many things. The problem here is, that, for example, for, for many people, not just for, for Latinos or for African Americans, for Blacks, for, for all the communities, it's for the country itself and for the survival of the peace of our hemisphere in so many ways. We have seen this in, I mean, when, when somebody, when a leadership like this lost its grounds, uh, there, there are spaces that, that are filled with other, other powers, other actors, either legal or illegal and coming from different parts. This is a very worrisome situation. And what happened in El Paso last year was for me uh, like a breaking point. When, 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 when American citizens are against American citizens, no matter uh, who they are, it's just the different, you know, different from, from, from a different uh, group, uh, just because of what, they, well, of what they represent, just because of the division that has been causing the country and the possibility of a, a El Paso massacre happening in other places, it's, it's the worrisome part. You know, one thing is the continuation of policies. Okay, this is horrible, we have lived with this, we can't, no, this is, going to be, this is going to be worse. More El Paso massacres might happen in different places in the country. And I'm thinking about what has been happening in Seattle, in Portland, in, in, uh, in Minnesota, in Michigan. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, you know, Americans against Americans, just because they have a different color of skin, different skin color. So it's, it's not going to be only the same, it's going to be more divisive and the United States is going, going to continue losing uh, moral grounds and, and, and legitimacy as, as, as a country that, that can solve problems and can solve its own problems. The image of the United States is broken right now in the world in many, in many regards. So I don't, I, I, I'm not partisan, I don't vote in the country, so just, just want to say that, uh, I'm Mexican. Uh, but I have seen that, right? And myself as an immigrant in the United States uh, with documents, I'm very worried that, that, that this situation is going, to, is going to be more difficult for, for, for many of us. Thank you, thank you so much. And we're running now out of time and I wanna thank each of you, Brian Concanon of, of Project Blueprint, Indrin Amirthana Gayam, Thank, thank you for you. the wonderful poems that you've contributed. Dr. Guadalupe Carrea Carrera, thank you so much for your contributions today. And I want to thank everyone here who has participated with your wonderful questions. And again, please follow us on Mirror Alliance. We'll be having more of these formative webinars. We have one coming up on November 18th that will be announced shortly. And again, please follow our blog. You'll find us on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And again, I'm Yvette Lagantri. And one thing we didn't get to talk too much about was some of the multilateral efforts that I think are very important in um, addressing, uh, addressing these issues. So more to talk about always in the issue of immigration. Um, so we're winding down. Any final comments? We have two more minutes. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you the audience. We have um, up here that the Miami Herald op-ed mentioned by Brian, you, will, you can find that on um, Miami Herald Opinion. Thank you all very much. And Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Meet Thank you. you and talk. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, Thank you. you. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Adios. Bye-bye. Adios. Bye. Thank Work you. together. Okay. Bye. Let's keep in touch. Cheers. Keep in touch.